um, this evening we're here to talk about otaku, a major feature of Japanese culture and indeed it's spread well beyond Japan. Um, and the title is I'm Alone But Not Lonely and we certainly aren't alone or lonely tonight, we've got quite a good turnout so it's, it's lovely to see so many people here. Um, and as I said I'm not really going to play any major role this evening um, because uh, on my right here, Paul O'Kane <coughs> is going to be our chair and moderator. So I'll just briefly introduce Paul and then he can introduce the other speakers. So uh, Paul lectures in fine art and critical studies at Central St. Martins. Uh, and he is an artist himself um, and makes and exhibits artworks concerned with history of technologies and narrative. And he also writes for a number of leading art journals. Uh, and that's probably all I need to say. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, thanks to everybody for coming along tonight. It's uh, really thrilling to see um, the uh, the bookings get uh, filled up and see you all here. Um, so I'm not going to speak for too long. Um, and uh, in a minute, I'll hand over to uh, to Volker Grasmark uh, and then Griseldis Kirsch will also speak. And then we'll go to kind of Q and A. Um, and I'll moderate those uh, questions. I just wanted to say a few words about uh, this little book, uh, which is uh, kind of brought us all here tonight. Uh, <laughs> um, it's based on a, an essay written by Volker Grasmark in 1990 um, on his uh, visit to Japan and his kind of uh, um, <coughs> fascination, really, with uh, what he discovered there at the time. I think he mentioned in his new introduction he wrote for the book that uh, when he arrived, just after he arrived, the Berlin Wall uh, fell, fell uh, but uh, that the disorientation he felt about experiencing Tokyo culture was even greater than the disorientation of the collapse of the wall. Um, I used the essay, uh, uh, I'm Alone But Not Lonely, by Volker Grasmuck uh, repeatedly for uh, several years, uh, trying to get uh, fine art students uh, interested in reading. Uh, and, uh, and trying to find texts that they found accessible uh, but thought-provoking and um, something about Volker's style of writing um, was incredibly empathetic and uh, we should say user-friendly uh, I think uh, and uh, as I say in the preface I wrote for the, the book version of the essay um, something about Volker's writing is also uh, I, I called it strangely visual uh, so that all the time you're you're reading the text, uh, uh, pictures kind of come to mind of what uh, Volker was experiencing in, in Tokyo in 1989. And I think it's partly for that reason that students enjoyed uh, working with it. Um, I'm working with uh, two uh, wonderful colleagues, Barda Song and Barnaby Lambert, as uh, uh, um, a kind of holy trinity, uh, running a small artist publishing company called Iodo. And uh, this is our third uh, publication. And uh, um, it was Barnaby's suggestion that we turn this, uh, this essay that we all uh, had all enjoyed and used into uh, a new accessible uh, uh, book form. Um, we also, uh, um, uh, during the kind of design process, uh, commissioned uh, 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 one of my ex students, Ken Yang Q, a uh, manga artist, to illustrate the text. And uh, you see some of these images here. And they kind of perf they kind of um, uh, illustrate the book in a very beautiful way, which I think again kind of adds a new um, uh, dimension to to the essay. Um, so this book will be available for sale this evening uh, at a special price uh, after we've uh, had a, 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 a long uh, discussion about the subject of otaku. Um, and then just before I hand over to to Volker to to speak. Um, um, I'd better just quickly introduce uh, Volker and, 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 and Grisel. Just Grisel uh, Volker is a media sociologist. Um, I'm reading a, a, a detailed description now. Volker Grisel is a media sociologist, freelance author and activist. Uh, he studied and conducted research on the knowledge order of digital media, copyright, and the knowledge commons at Free University uh, Berlin, Tokyo. Dr. Griseldis Kirsch is Senior Lecturer in Contemporary Japanese Culture at SOAS University of London. And uh, I think that um, 
Uh, the evening should be quite rich uh, in perspectives on the otaku. Um, I'll just finally say that uh, I think my own fascination, my own reason for um, bringing the text into play uh, with my undergraduate uh, fine arts students um, was because when I first started teaching fine arts, I felt that the, uh, the generation, the younger generation I was teaching were strangely embroiled in new technology but without any particular kind of critical traction or uh, um, perspective on, on their new technology. And I almost felt it a sort of duty as a, somebody of a, of a slightly older generation to introduce them into um, a historical perspective on their own experiences. Um, and I think that that's what I feel is motivates me as a tutor. Uh, and so I tend to look through the history of, uh, history of art to find um, comparable uh, scenarios, uh, other ages in which new technologies uh, have transformed the way uh, we live and challenged artists to renew what art can be. Um, and in that respect, um, Volker's uh, essay was a wonderful kind of interface for me uh, between my own historical interests and the students' uh, new lifestyles. So I think I've said enough now, and uh, I can hand over to Volker, who's just arrived in London <laughs> and come straight to the uh, to the podium, really. Um, and I just wanted, wanted to thank uh, uh, thank uh, Volker and uh, Griselis for uh, and uh, everybody at Daiwu and people at UAL uh, uh, and uh, our funders uh, Arts Council and uh, uh, for, for for helping uh, make, making the whole event possible. So I'll hand over to Volker. Yeah, thank you, Paul, for the uh, wonderful introduction, for the initiative of creating this book. Uh, thanks also to Bada Song and Barnaby Lambert for bringing this book into existence. Thank you. Uh, to Tengyo and Ki for the illustrations we're seeing here, to Griselis for her contri upcoming contribution right after I'm, I'm done. Okay. Uh, thank you to Daiwa Foundation for hosting us here tonight. Thank you to all of you, most of all. Uh, I, I still find it amazing the kind of interest that otaku still attract uh, nearly 30 years after they, they were first discovered. Um, in thinking about what to say during my 50 minutes of fame tonight, um, I was reading around 1990s materials, but also uh, more contemporary uh, scholarship on otakuology. Uh, it has become an academic field in a sense. Um, and then I kept getting distracted by uh, dramatic world affairs. Until I realized that these two are inherently linked. And I knew the title of my talk would have to be The Otaku and the Donald. <laughs> there are differences, of course, and I'm not implying that Trump is an otaku, maybe a particularly narrow-minded person, but there are <coughs> common trajectories that, that I'll try to explore tonight. In the 1990s, Otaku were young male introverts avoiding face-to-face -face, uh, encounters, focusing their interests on selected narrow fields of fictitious popular culture, connected to the outside world through media. The media at that time were basically television, videotapes, uh, <coughs> magazines, manga, and so on. Uh, already the, the first beginnings of digital networks, but those were not yet the internet, but bulletin board systems. So we're seeing a form of splendid isolation wired to the world and therefore alone but not lonely. Explanations for the social phenomenon included otaku as a strategy for escaping from conformist society that hammers in the nail that sticks out and the pressure, especially on young males, uh, into a rigid career path. If you don't feel comfortable where you are, you can rebel and fight back. You can get a depression, which seems to be the disease of our times, or you can escape. 
You can escape outwardly. You can run away, hitchhike around the country, sleep in parks, and so on. Or you can escape inwardly. By locking yourself in, staying at home, focusing on a small area of interest that you can actually master, uh, withdrawing into a comf comforting shelter, an electronic womb. Even though otaku are not resisting or rebelling, some observers noted a subversive quality in their overfulfilling the demands of consumerism and technology. By the same token, one could see them as an avant-garde, only accelerating dominant tendencies in society, being the perfect corporate warriors for current Japanese capitalism. Their immersion into media was seen as the cause for their loss of a sense of reality, typically adding that this is characteristic of the postmodern information society as a whole. This is one of the many paradoxes running through the story. Society depicts the newly discovered otaku as aliens, as the other within, adding in the same breath we are all otaku. <coughs> they were seen as dropouts and typical Japanese at the same time. But what has that got to do with majorities voting for Brexit and Trump, or 25% of votes in Saxony-Anhalt for uh, AfD? For the, is AfD, is that known here? The alternative for Germany? It's a, it's a political party that grew out of a street movement um, that, that calls itself uh, PEGIDA, so Patriotic Europeans Against the Islamization of the Occident. Um, and, of course, other nationalist, nationalist isolationist movements across Europe all the way to Russia and Turkey. So what do the otaku have to do with those? At first hand, it looks to me, they look to me like aliens from a long gone past, rising from the grave. More like zombies than aliens. They themselves obviously don't see themselves as aliens, but as response, as a response to aliens. To refugees, migrants, people not like us. Both Otaku and the new nationalists <coughs> are driven by fear. Otaku is responding to pressures by society, so, otaku is an escapist, responds to that, and the pressures of globalization and complexity lead IFD members to escapism as well. Both are egotistic strategies. For the otaku, it's an individualist me first. For the xenophobes, it's a collective us first, to the exclusion of all others. Both are a way to reduce complexity. The otaku, by radically restricting their interest, for example, on a number of minor idols, on model kits, on any kind of technology, the new nationalists reduce complexity by populist simplification and by going for simple solutions. The first meeting of the president-elect Trump with a foreigner was, Nigel, was with Nigel Farage. That was not the beginning, but an important landmark in the rise of an isolationist international. Another one of those paradoxes. In the 1990s, we thought the effect of the internet would be to network the planet, to make the world one with everyone speaking to each other, bringing us closer to the enlightenment ideals of a global society running on a Habermasian rational discourse where we exchange ideas, opinions, critiques, so that the best argument may win. Otaku is a story of expansion as well, starting from the million youngsters that came out of nowhere to the first screening of the animation Space Battleship Yamato in 1977. And they made Japanese uh, society realize for the first time that something was brewing. They spread out into manga stores, to Tokyo's electronics dis district Akihabara, and tens of thousands of them, uh, of these shy and unsociable otaku, are meeting at comic case and comic cons <coughs> and comic markets and co conventions. Then otaku expanded abroad as well. 
not as a business strategy, not by means of marketing, but uh, it's told that Western expat kids in Japan picked up otaku items and sent them home to their friends. Similar ad routes also made otaku culture popular in China, Korea, Thailand, which is much less talked about because it's seen as much less flattering as being emulated by the West. Otaku culture is gaining traction, no, otaku culture gaining traction in the West marked what Mizuko Ito in his 2012 book Fandom Unbound called a shift in cultural geopolitics. That's a shift from the 1980s when Japan stood for high tech and high business to the 1990s when Japan's economy declined but found that its pop culture became an export success. In the 1980s in the West, people studied Japanology in order to do business with or in Japan. In the 1990s, students wanted to learn Japanese in order to appreciate Japanese pop culture, and particularly in its otaku form, in the original language. The relations were reversed. Underground became mainstream, the potential of otaku for information capitalism became manifest. Uh, nowadays in Berlin and London, in every major city, you have an otaku ecosystem with specialty stores, uh, specialty sections in comic shops, shops or department stores, and comic cards with tens of thousands of otaku gathering, just like in 1990 in Mako Harimesa in Tokyo. Now, the official Japan came to embrace its otaku, whom earlier it had been embarrassed about. To the point, so they embraced them to the point where it became a feature in Nihonjinro, the discourse on Japaneseness. Western kids might do all the things their Japanese counterparts are doing, going through the same moves, expressing themselves in the same way, but Nihon Jinron effected a closure by claiming that real otaku can only exist in Japan. An important landmark was Japan's Gross National Cool, an article by journalist Douglas McGray in the magazine Foreign Policy in 2002. McRae pointed to the million dollar business of Hello Kitty and an exhibition of Japanese pop culture at New York Art Gallery PS1, and he wrote that Japan is reinventing superpower again. Its global cultural influence has grown, quote, in fact, from pop music to consumer electronics, architecture to fashion and food to art, Japan has far greater cultural influence now than it did in the 1980s, when it was an economic superpower. The novel Densha Otoko, The Train Man, published in 2004, marked another important turning point, this time inside Japan, inside the Japanese discourse. The otaku love story unfolded when the 20-year-old hero rides home on the subway from Akihabara a drunk man molests a pretty woman, and he intervenes. Very un-otaku-like, but he did, and he falls in love. When he comes home, um, he relays his, his adventure on the online forum Nichan, where most of the story unfolds. It becomes a public affair there, and his fellow otaku are giving him advice uh, on how to approach the girl. He keeps reporting back, until the happy end. It was made into several manga series and manga books and into a TV series, so quite popular. By representing otaku as harmless and as, uh, as ha <coughs> I'm sorry, as harmless and endearing, Densha Otoku helped to remove the subculture's negative and sociopathic connotations and to recast it in a much more sympathetic light. The otaku already preferred their fellow humans in 2D as manga and as anime or as plastic models, preferring inanimate machines, even online, not communicating, but sending out info snippets, boasting with factoids. But as mainstream Japan expanded to engulf otaku, a new school generation has to find its own strategy. 
The term hikikomori goes back to at least 1973, when psychoanalyst Takeo Doi addressed it in his book, The Anatomy of Dependence. He identified the symptoms of hikikomori as originating in the Japanese psychological construct of amai, sort of um, a kind of bonding between mother and infant. So the analysis was that these kids, these people, uh, don't manage the transition from youth to adulthood. The current wave of hikikomori seems to have emerged in the 1990s. And it, it refers to teenagers dropping out of school, withdrawing from society, even their family, staying in their room for weeks, months, years. Radically severing all remaining bodily ties with others. As shy as, and as unsocial as, as otaku were, they still went to Akihabara and Shinjuku bookstores or to comikes. The hikikomori don't. They depend on their parents, they don't have an income, because even online click work would involve social contact. While otaku expanded, the following generation radicalized the withdrawal and the closure. As a sociologist, I've been interested in the boundaries of social systems, how they are constructed, negotiated, traversed, and how media are used to bridge or reinforce them, and among them, particularly network digital devices. Indeed, one has to be online in front of a screen, if even only a small screen, the small screen of a smartphone, in order to be connected to the world. The splendid isolation of the otaku and the hikikomori alone, but not lonely, is possible through, but is also a necessary condition of digital media environment. Otaku drop out of the wider society, the complexity of contrarian opinions, ignoring most of that, focusing on a very narrow, specific scope of subject matter. In spite of media, what we are seeing these days is the opposite of connectivism. Brexit and Trump, xenophobic, isolationist, populist movements across Europe are all about a networked separationism. After the Iron Curtain and the Berlin Wall, Paul mentioned it, has gone for 27 years, new walls are going up around Europe, around the United States, around the highway in France leading to the Channel Tunnel. Links are severed. Even free trade agreements that one would expect a businessman like Trump to promote, he questions for the sake of America first. It's an anti-pluralist movement driving towards homogenization. Those taking to the streets in Leipzig, that's where this uh, Pegida movement started, calling we are the people, have an idea of we and people that excludes large parts of the population, in the way turning victims into culprits and scapegoats. What they're saying is only we are the real people. One of Trump's first announcements was that he would deport and incarcerate as many as three million undocumented <coughs> immigrants. Has the openness and global connectivity of the internet, the democratization of pu the public sphere it created itself, create, uh, caused a backlash? Are uh, social media to blame for Brexit and Trump? The scandal of Nicholas Luhmann's social systems theory is that there is no communication between a system and its environment, only irritation. Social but also psychological systems are autopoietic auto and operationally closed. What a system lets itself be irritated by depends not depends on the internal its internal makeup and not on its environment. The term filter bubble came up because of algorithms suggesting items that reinforce existing preferences. Thinking about the novelty of this technical effect made us realize that it was there all along. 
fanatics looking at the world through particularly narrowing, simplifying glasses, only talking to each other, battling any other uh, opinion, had existed always. Otaku are physically isolated but networked online, which relieves them from face-to-face -face communication, yet connects them so they don't feel alone. But since they have so radically restricted their fields of interest, also the number of people sharing those fields, worth of info snippets one can boast with, is very small. Postmodernism hailed the end of the grand narrative and praised the emerging multiplicity of stories. Now we start to realize that without a grand narrative, the conversations of the many tend towards subconversations of like-minded and creating echo chambers. Um, a democratic sphere needs opposition and contestation, the fundamental experience that you have to accept different opinions. Social media seem to make us unlearn this basic fact of democracy. In homogeneous, like-minded groups, people speaking to each other, but only about the other, only ab about the other, not with the other, still need to distinguish themselves. Some of them are doing this by topping what is commonly, commonly agreed, finding more radically radical, aggressive, dirty expressions, in the process radicalizing the average opinion of the entire group. Um, by a member of AFD, AFD, diversity and information overload are seen as threat creating this contraction, the strive for homogeneity and collective egotism. In the collective hatred against foreigners and Muslims, they only communicate with like-minded people. So this is a collective escape into a post-factual politics. It's in us and them. Foreigners, people who don't belong here, but also the liar's press, which is a term frequently heard in Germany these days. Um, corrupt politicians, the cultural elites, they are all them, the others. Otaku and nationalists share information fetishism. Information is not used as building blocks for understanding the world, but for building walls inside one's head. All this was there before digital media, but those provide public platforms for it and re reinforce the effects of concentration. Algorithms that suggest more of the same, again, reinforce <coughs> the filter bubbles. The Wall Street Journal, by the way, has a, a beautiful website, um, Blue Feed, Red Feed, uh, where you can see a liberal and a conservative filter bubble uh, of uh, Facebook posts uh, side by side. That's, that's very, very interesting. I can re recommend that. And furthermore, there are social bots that bloat and strengthen a dominant discourse uh, in a community <coughs> even more, and which seem to have played a significant part both in Brexit and Trump. So my feeling is the filter bubble is in a way, an unintended self-otakuization. But beware, filter bubbles are nothing righteous or digital. For example, media and forecasters have flogged themselves after the Trump victory for having failed to detect was, what was coming. Journalists, scientists, politicians, cultural theorists, and practitioners have their sensorial instruments, but they have their preconceptions as well. People like us, gathered here at Daiwa Foundation tonight, don't tend to think that we are inside a bubble, but we are. Fear is behind otaku and nationalists. Fear of being overrun by hordes of aliens, a kind of agoraphobia, fear of openness, of connectedness, of diversity, and fear might lead to paranoia, and one form of paranoia is delusions of grandeur. X first, 
make X great again, where X is a nation state. Another unit that we thought was outdated and would wither away with globalization. Instead, Trump promises import duties and uh, uh, import duties to replace free trade and exit from international treaties and agencies. We see a, a reverberation across Europe. Wilders, Le Pen, Orban, uh, writers from Italy, Austria, Germ and Germany, all the way to Putin who cheered Trump. So this is, they, they see each other as an affirmation of their own xenophobia, racism and separatism. An open and strong United States is seen as a threat to national autonomy, but a separatist US is seen as brother in spirit, the spirit of isolation, and um, German neo-Nazis and Russian neo-Nazis have no problems of holding friendly meetings on each other's territory. So there is an international of nationalist egotists emerging. Um, let's see, considering the time, well, I'll just go through quickly. The idea seems to gain traction that the citizen, the sovereign of democracy, is not the well-informed and well-reasoned rational person uh, taking the best decisions for herself and the outcome uh, and the common good um, whom we find in textbooks, and which is, of course, the idea of Habermas. Instead, the citizen is lazy, driven by subconscious desires and drives, often does what he knows isn't good for him and therefore needs some nudging. Propaganda, public relations, nudging, uh, even on the part of governments, treats the recipient not as a rational counterpart, but more like a machine whose buttons you can press to get a desired effect. Uh, AFD members are expressly believing in a felt reality, hardened against being disproven by facts. Anti-Islamism is strongest where there are no Muslims. Again, another one of these paradoxes. Uh, maybe one fears most what one doesn't know and what can grow bigger in one's, one's imagination. Don't be afraid, Trump told the many US Americans who are scared of his presidency in his first TV interview. Um, and about the protesters against him, I just don't think they know me. In light of a deep division running through society, what can we do? Again, I'm a hopeless Habermasian in many respects. I think that uh, parliamentary democracy is a good thing because it forces different perspectives and positions into discussion, compromise, and finding majorities. The Japanese handbook education emerged as one of the factors leading to otaku. Wrote classroom, classroom learning, cramming facts that prepare you for multiple choice tests and TV quizzes, but not for life, and so, certainly not for life in a complex and rapidly changing society. A society in which such fundamental categories like labor or even our survival as a species in what we have come to realize as a single, limited, global, and most of all man-made uh, environment are called into question. What we need, I think, is something as bold and as fundamental as the challenges we face. Something like a new Marshall Plan. Not unilaterally, of course, but collectively, as a concerted recovery program with two main pillars. And the first pillar is not to give people work. We are approaching the point where machine labor is cheaper than even human labor in Bangladesh or in commercial prisons. It's not about creating jobs, but about fundamentally rethinking wealth production and distribution, the common wealth. A guaranteed basic income would be a good start, and it would take away the fear, the existential fear, whether justified or not, that drives the current otakuization of the world. The second pillar 
is a Marshall Planian collective effort of re-education. Civic education in Germany is taught, uh, taught only in secondary school. Some states like Bavaria and Saxony allow their students to unelect these courses. So you can graduate in Germany and go on to university without any kind of education on uh, how democracy works. This is one of the effects of Pisa mania that focuses on the homo economicus and doesn't value the homo politicus as a goal of education. Enlightenment and democracy are not just about passing the controls to the people, they are most of all in, about enabling them to take that responsibility. If we want people's decisions to be based on fundamental democratic values and human rights, on empathy and solidarity, these need to be taught from elementary school onwards. The network public sphere has a diversity of op opinions as never before, but masses of stuff aren't necessarily diversity. Under conditions of overload, diversity becomes an effort on the side of the recipient. The skill needed here is media literacy, knowing the difference between a tweet and an article, an article from Murdoch and from BBC, a human speaker and a social bot. We are living in a pluralistic, multicultural society. There is no turning back. We need a new social contract in order to adapt it. This is just my two cents worth, and I am very well aware that I am speaking from inside my bubble. The only way that I know how to get out of a bubble is through dialogue with empathy and reason, and I'm looking forward to the dialogue with you and with all of you. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you, Paul, for inviting me and Jason and the Dial Foundation for making this event possible. I'm Griselle Deskirch, as Paul has already said, and I'm teaching, I, I teach popular culture at SAWAS. When I started doing Japanese in the 1990s, um, there's a different life story behind it. It's not because I wanted to read Japanese stuff in the original for a change, but I was one of the few, I admit. So, um, but I went deliberately to university that did contemporary Japan because I wanted a degree in contemporary Japanese studies. When I then ended up do, um, researching Japanese popular culture, sort of towards the beginning of the new millennium as a PhD candidate at that same university, I was put on the same level as an otaku, because you are just reading that stuff. And when I then pointed out it was television, I became a television kind of otaku. Um, there was a huge stigma involved in researching popular culture. Thankfully, that's gone. Um, so, it's one way to have, otakudom has become one way to engage with Japan, and it certainly keeps a stream of people getting into degrees in Japanese studies all over the world, not just in the UK. In the academic discourse and in learning and teaching about <coughs> Japan, um, initially the term otaku used to have a lot of social stigma. It was confined to a very small, uh, researching otaku was confined to a very small number of researchers and they would usually gather in the anthropology and sociology sections of international conferences and they were in their own bubble, to say with your words. Maybe the reason was um, that otaku were being pushed out of the limelight by Miyazaki Tsutomu, um, a guy who committed a number of murders and young girls in the late 1980s. Um, he did these murders in sort of, and it, it became public that he was an otaku by sort of him making murders according to script in a way. So um, this led to a media panic. The media started writing about contact otaku in a very negative way. And before that, they had almost ignored them. The discourse now suddenly meant uh, they are dangerous individuals and they almost became a standing army of murderers, ready to go um, if, it just, if you just pull the trigger. At the same time, those same media outlets completely overlooked 
that they themselves were what kept them alive and kept them going. This kind of stigma prevailed for a very long time, and as I said, I studied in the 1990s, and I started my first cautious steps as researcher in the um, dawn of the new millennium. It was still there. Um, it was very hard <coughs> to find a sympathetic account of otaku anywhere in that period of time, except for focus essay um, that I tended to point my students towards. Explanations as to why otaku existed were best centered around the social problems that Japan faced. At worst, they indicated in the Nihon Jinnon like discourse that there was some element of the Japanese psyche that led people to become otaku because they were capable of being more obsessed than anybody else. Completely again overlooking that Trekkies, Star Trek fans put on plastic ears and go to conventions which is very close to what you, otaku do, you could argue. So, we've come a long way from, the, from that. These days, um, the term has changed meaning slightly. It's entered the Oxford English Dictionary in September 2004, so it's been around for quite a while, but if you look it up, um, you find, I quote, brackets, in Japan, a young person who is obsessed with computers or particular <laughs> aspects of popular culture to the detriment of their social skills. So this um, detriment of the social skills, the social ineptness, oops, continues to prevail somewhere, in spite of the fact that there has been a shift in meaning, because if you talk to someone about being an otaku these days, what means you will be, if you just Google it, you will find yourself on manga and anime web pages. So it means more that in this country it is someone who is very much into Japanese popular culture, reads manga, consumes anime, and you will find web pages of distributors. So the fewer pa there are fewer panicky undertones than there used to be in the past. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, this is the fault of sorry, <laughs> this, the novel, Train Man, Densha Otoko in Japanese. It's been translated into English, and I think it's also been sold as fairly good success. That Foka already mentioned, there's the television series with a very stylish, that way, um, package, and a film. Um, I was in Japan in 2005 by a sheer coincidence uh, when this was aired on television, and all of a sudden, otaku became cool. It was, of course, it was okay to, that's okay, it was okay to self-proclaim to be an otaku. It was okay <coughs> to even say, um, I read a lot of manga. It wasn't okay when the Prime Minister Aso Taro then called himself an otaku. That didn't go down too well. <laughs> because that was perhaps cutting it a little bit too uh, far. But, in a sense, you could argue that this positive re-evaluation of otaku led to Cool Japan. The um, clear marketing strategies by the Japanese government to uh, promote what was once otaku culture to the rest of the world. So, we shouldn't be underestimating it. And when these days I talk about the fact that I research popular culture, I'm actually quite cool. So, <laughs> even in that respect, it has changed. So, as I already said, this coolness of Japan, the otaku culture that comes with it, has generated a steady stream of students interested in Japan. And once you engage with a different country, learn a different language, you open your mind to that culture. So, that brings us to the more positive aspects of the internet. Yes, we can sit in our little bubble. But the internet also makes cross-cultural consumption of popular culture possible. Legal aspects, of course, notwithstanding, uh, manga, anime, and K-pop are more easily to find and consumed uh, to be consumed than when I was started uh, when I started doing Japanese. It's become a lot easier to immerse yourself in a popular culture from another country than it was perhaps ever before. So. You, in a way, open your filter bo bubble. Um, you go and engage, but you create a new one. You sit yourself in the filter bubble that is otaku culture, and you may then have to escape from that. Uh, even if then these students end up in our classrooms, it 
can be that filter bubble of Japanese popular culture can occasionally be a bit of a challenge because we are on a constant journey to debunk the stereotypes. But then again, we have our own. So um, we are also then very cautious not to impose our own stereotypes on others. Which, in my opinion, it is good to have discourses and counter discourses on the subject, and this is why I'm looking very much forward to the discussion. Um, so I am also trying to make students always aware of both. What they would more readily find on the internet uh, in, or still is otaku as murderers, or the standing army of murderers. Um, I try to direct them to different discourses. And that's why what focus work continues to be important because it was a compassionate account and it was the first one and it sort of was one that was written when no one really wrote about it yet. So um, you looked at the um, socially inept sites but you didn't highlight the moral panic that many that followed did. So you were in a way, what you did with that essay was Densha Otoko before Densha Otoko. So, um, which is why I'm glad this little booklet is printed and it's more readily available again. Well, thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Grisodis, and thank you, Volk. Uh, I understand if I speak here, uh, there's a microphone on the table that means that Grisodis and Volk can speak in there, is that right? Um, and I've been asked to kind of prompt discussion and uh, moderate discussion and uh, form discussion, I suppose. Um, so while uh, people might be thinking of um, questions they might uh, want to ask, um, I'll just see if I can start the ball rolling um, by... Um, I, I think I'll just talk myself into trouble and then try and talk myself out of it again. Um, so, I suppose uh, one of the wonderful things about, about those two presentations is, is that they, uh, they, 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 they seem to um, um, paint uh, um, different uh, pictures, or different perspectives. Um, that there is a kind of... Um, I mean, Volker's presentation um, clearly um, focuses on the current political... Um, crisis that a lot of us would regard as a political crisis uh, at the moment. Um, um, and in a way seems to use the otaku today um, as a model. Uh, you talked about the otakuization of the world in a way, uh, or the political world, or I think, um, as a model and even a kind of cause, a causal uh, um, agency. Uh, leading us into these kind of modes of isolation, etc. Um, and I'm just uh, a little bit dubious about um, that uh, analogy, um, wondering whether... I don't know, I, I was thinking kind of historically um, that what we're afraid of today is a recurrence of, uh, of a 1930s scenario, um, uh, and whether we could then look at scenarios in the 1930s to see something, to make the same kind of analogy you're making here, between um, a new generation of people influenced by technology and a, a shift in capitalist economy, really, to, um, to behave in a certain way. And that behavior then start, start, starts to kind of uh, infect the political system as a, as a whole, in a way. I mean, I'm, I'm now summarizing and probably misrepresenting your, your uh, argument a bit there. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, I just wonder how accurate it is, um, and if we looked at history, could we really find similar models? Um, um, or, or, or is it inaccurate? Um, the other thing I want to, the other, the other thing I sort of could find when I look, back, look at, at history is, is um, the Otaku is not necessarily, uh, necessarily so exceptional. In uh, your essay, Volker, you talk about uh, a kind of yuppie equivalent <laughs> uh, 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 in, to in Tokyo culture, and, and there's, there's this sense in which um, new generations will uh, kind of um, uh, inexorably uh, encounter new economies and adopt these mysterious 
um, subcultures that, that we can only kind of think of as a zeitgeist in a way. I mean, it's hard to rationalize how, as, as you said, the, the otaku were latent in the society. They suddenly appear on the screening of this movie and suddenly become a kind of national phenomenon. And, uh, uh, I, mean, I think that, that phenomenon of, of youth sub subcultures uh, fascinates us all, and it's, and it's quite mysterious. Um, and it does always seem to have a sort of economic, uh, possibly economic kind of cause. Um, so, um, so uh, I, I suppose I'm, I'm left a little bit, uh, uh, kind of uh, agreeing with your 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 uh, sort of fear, quite sort of fearful position about the, about contemporary politics, um, and, and not quite convinced about whether we should really apply the otaku model as, as a cause uh, or a, an, an analogy. Um, and on the other hand, in, in response to Griselda's uh, paper, I think I'm thinking <coughs> a lot about uh, cool Britannia, <laughs> the swing in the well. 60s, uh, other, other, other ways in which uh, nations have uh, per mis sort of expropriated this youth cultural energy and turned it into an economic force. Um, so I, I guess maybe I, I haven't really talked myself out of trouble yet, but... but uh, <laughs> um.